When it gets to the moon, everyone wants identical things. Non in the sense of having shared objectives, but in the sense that all actors focus on the same strategic sections, state agencies including the private sector. In fact, whether you need to do science or get money, you will need things like light and water. Multiple nations and individual companies have ambitious plans to exploit or explore the moon. It won't be long, but early, still in this decade. As we noticed in an article, written in Transactions of the Royal Society, this will create stress on the ground except we find ways to deal with the impending situation. Until now, enough of the debate about mining and exploring the moon has centered on tensions in the space among the private sector and state agencies. But in our opinion, the urgent challenge comes from short strategic resources. Sites of scientific importance are also necessary for infrastructure development by government agencies or commercial users. These sites cover peaks of eternal light, where sunlight is nearly constant and hence access to energy, and permanently shaded craters in the polar regions, where water ice is found. All are rare and the combination of the couple, ice on the crater floor and a narrow peak of eternal light on the crater rim, is a valuable multiplayer target. However, they only happen in the polar regions, somewhat at the equatorial sites targeted by the Apollo program during the 1960s and 1970s. China's recent victorious landing of Change 5 directed at a relatively easy landing site on the lunar side. However, is part of a larger, more gradual program that is to return the Space Agency of China to the lunar south pole in 2024. India attempted a further direct polar route, including its failed Chandrayaan-2 lander, crashing in a similar region in 2019. Russia's Roscosmos, along with the European Space Agency, also aiming the South Polar region. For arriving in late 2021 and, in 2023, in Boguslavsky crater, as an inspection mission. Therefore, Roscosmos will target the Aitken Basin in a similar region in 2022 to seek water in lastingly shaded areas. Various individual companies also have ambitious plans to obtain resources from the Moon. Important resources not found in polar regions needs to be concentrated rather than equal. Uranium and thorium, which could be adopted as radioactive fuel, are spotted together in 34 regions less than 80 km wide. Iron from asteroid impacts can be found in larger territories, with a diameter of between 30 and 300 km, however, there are only approximately 20 of these areas. And then there's the lunar resource poster, drawn from dozens of science fiction films, Helium-3, for nuclear fusion. Sowed by the sun into dusty rock crushed on the lunar surface, it is found in large areas of the moon, however, the highest concentrations are detected around eight regions, all nearly small, less than 50 kilometers in diameter. Certain materials will be of interest both to those attempting to establish infrastructure on the moon and then point to Mars as well as to commercial, miners, or science, such as by creating telescopic arrays on the opposite side of the moon, far away. The increasing sound of human communications. So how do you tackle the problem? The Outer Space Treaty, 1967, establishes that the research and use of outer space must be carried out for the advantage and benefit of all countries and must be the territory of all humanity. Nations do not claim part of the moon as assets, but they can still use it. It is unclear where this leaves conflict and extraction by private companies. Suggested successors to the procedure, such as the Moon Agreement, 1979, are considered too restrictive, asking for a formal framework of laws and an ambitious worldwide regulatory regime. The deal failed to win the support of major players, including the United States, Russia, and China. Numerous recent milestones, like the Artemis Accords, a set of guidelines surrounding the Artemis manned lunar exploration program, are considered strongly linked to the US program. In the most unfavorable case, this absence of structure could lead to increased stresses on Earth. However, it could further create useless duplication of infrastructure as everyone builds their own stuff. 
This would increase costs for private organizations, who would then have reason to try to recover in such a way as to undermine the possibilities of science and the legacy we leave for coming generations. Our most excellent beginning response may be modest, drawing inspiration from abandoned sites on Earth. Small land resource basins, such as lakes bordered by various villages, or fish stocks, are usually managed using locally developed approaches by the main stakeholders. Certain advises that an initial step towards the governance of lunar resources will be to create an agreement with users. This should concentrate on the nature of the assets at stake, how their profits should be divided, and most importantly, the most serious case outlines they seek to avoid. Such as stakeholders will probably have to decide whether eternal light peaks will be managed as high-value real estate or as a power generation volume to share. It can also be helpful to decide on a situation-by-situation -situation basis. Extra challenge will be to promote an agreement with the governance arrangements developed. To this end, Moon users would do well to build shared facilities, like landing and refueling facilities, to run as hubs that misbehaving actors can hide. These partial answers will be difficult to attach after a country or company has performed irrevocable investments in mission design. Surely, the time has come to design these approaches. That's all for now. Thanks for watching the science news. For more details, please visit widelyexplore.com.